A good afternoon, our dear viewers of Civic Space TV. The Youth Roundtable is back. We condole with those who have lost their loved ones through the bomb attacks we've had, and we ask you to be vigilant in all the ways that you already know. But today on the Youth Roundtable, we are going to trace Uganda's economic journey. 59 years down the road, where are we? How far have we come? Have we actually been transformed, or are we still struggling? Some people argue that we have taken two steps forward and one step backward at every point, as the country has almost has no primary industry. The largest sectors like manufacturing, mining, telecommunication, banking are still largely run by foreigners. We are still exporting raw materials, which was one of the challenges talked about during independence. But there are also those who say our economy has grown significantly, oftentimes, you hear the president quoting figures from as recent as 1986, and you can see exponential growth. Today, we are going to analyze this. We want to see whether there has been actual progress or it's just a facade. And to do this, on my extreme right is Mr. Brian Atwaire, who prefers to be called a political activist. Because I am. You're welcome to the show. Thank you. And we have also been joined by a student from Uganda Matters, a student of Business Administration and Management, Denise Tugume. It's our pleasure to have you on the Youth Roundtable. Yes, thank you. It's a pleasure. Yes, and uh, very capable hands and brains, Duncan Abigaba. <laughs> now I think a household name does not shy from controversy. Duncan is the Deputy Director of GCIC, Government Citizen Interaction Center. He's going to tell us how our government or governments are, have performed since 1962. We are honored to have you. Thank you so much, Ndugu Matanda. I'm so happy to be here. It's my first time, and thank you so much, those who are joining us. Yes, and since it is your maiden appearance, I'm actually going to start with you. Where is Uganda's journey in the, in the past 59 years, economically? Yeah, so last week I was reading... Uh, the financial report from Bank of Uganda for the month of uh, September. That is the last month of uh, quarter one. And uh, Uganda posted, uh, you know, surplus, trade surplus with uh, the East African community. You know, the, we are a broke of six countries. Mm. And we had traded those with those countries in surplus of 44 million US dollars. It means we're exporting more than we are importing from those countries. Mm. Then we had also uh, posted a, a trade surplus with the rest of Africa. The rest of Africa, which is outside the East African community. We are in all those different trading groups in Comesa and others. And we had posted trade surplus of uh, for, of uh, 60, 60 million US dollars. Mm. So you can you can see with the region, with the continent, we are very good. Mm. We had had some issues with the, the our, rest of the world. with the rest of the world, particularly the Middle East, where we had always uh, posted positive, uh, positive, you know, trade surplus because of the recently introduced levy on uh, on gold. Recently, they put a levy of, um, I think, 5% on all refined gold exports, which has been controversial. And in the whole quarter, I think, or one month, we lost around 400 billion shillings. So that's why we had a deficit with the Middle East, where we had always been, you know, you know had positive mm. trade surplus. So last week also, we had the Minister for Agriculture uh, fragging off the first, uh, you know, the first... Uh, our, 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 our containers that we are going to Zambia mm -hmm. uh, with milk exports. For the first time in our history, we are exporting milk to Zambia. This country actually has a surplus for milk exports to the tune of around 800 million liters. That possibly explains a lot at the Dubai <laughs> Expo. <laughs> yes, it explains a lot at the Dubai Expo because this mm -hmm. is where our com comparative advantage is in agriculture. Uh, so we have we are posting surplus in 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 milk to the tune of around 800 million liters. We have wait 800 million liters. Yes, of milk. Wow. Yes, of milk. 
Uganda produces around 2 billion liters of milk. So when we, we take away local consumption, we have mm. a, an extra 800 million liters throughout around the world. Okay. Uh, right now, market is the challenge. You know, we have been having problems with Kenya. Mm. So we also have uh, maize. Uganda produces 5 million tons, million metric tons of maize. We are able to consume just two. So we have three million metric tons on market. Mm. We have been having problems. Tanzanians do not want to accept our maize. The other day, Kenyans made a, an allegation, which was not found to be true, that our, our maize. maize had some issues. I, I have Afro forgotten that. Aflatoxins mm. is the term. So, you know, there is that surplus of maize, three million metric tons. You also talk about sugar. We produce 510,000 metric tons of sugar. Uganda consumes only 340 metric tons of sugar. 340,000 metric tons of, of sugar. So you have a, a surplus of 170,000 metric tons of sugar, which the president has also been going around trying to, to get market for. He has had some concessions with the, the president of, of, of Tanzania, Her Excellency Samia, Sam, Samia Suruhu. Mm. So he is now the biggest problem actually that Uganda faces today is lack of market. Not for the, pro, not for the surplus mm. of so many goods that we have right now, the biggest problem. That's why you see President Museveni is very strong on the issue of the Federation of East Africa because he knows with East Africa now, we are 170 million people. If you had Congo, Congo has got around 100 million people. Now you have a 300 million strong market for our products. That's why you see the president is you know, very concerned about this integration, uh, mediating you know, problems in Sudan, in South Sudan. All these people are supporting us. For example, now the problems in Sudan, Khartoum, uh, the problems, the political problems that happened yesterday, the prime minister is under arrest and mm. so forth, is a very big bother to us because Khartoum, Sudan is the biggest importer of our coffee in Africa, except the coffee that goes to Europe and wherever. Mm. On this continent, Khartoum is our biggest you know, market. So, so we are bothered by all these things. So the problem now that Uganda faces is lack of market. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to come back to you with uh, some questions, but allow me now first cross to Brian. Duncan paints a very good image of our economy. It looks like uh, we are doing well, yet when I look around on social media and on some of these spaces, you political activists are always lamenting and painting a very gloomy picture. Political one. But that's uh, uh, for two sides. There can be a side of that one of the Duncan. Mm. The way he speaks, he's a political activist. Okay. But of, of one side. Okay. Of the side of <laughs> the ones that have uh, made our country look the way it is. And of course, they always paint a rosy, a, a rosy picture every time they are going to speak. I am. Does that make you the reverse of that? that you I, am, I, am, I am. I <laughs> No. I am for the ones who say what is, not what ought to be or what. So okay. As well yeah. as it is. Let's hear that. You see, this country got its independence in 1962. I don't believe in independence, but today I use the word independence. Mm. Uh, it had 7.2 million people. Now it has uh, both 45. And, mm. and of course, of course, of course, the population of the world has been growing. Mm -hmm. My problem is also the Duncan's won't take that credit. As if they are the cause of the war. We world. immunized you. <laughs> but, 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 but was the world uh, 7 billion people in 1962? Logic. So, so you, do, you, do you have to think that you, you, you stay alone if you're increasing? And, but but, but I, I want to tell uh, one, he's talking about agriculture. Agriculture employs the majority of our country, of our people. But what, what is its contribution to GDP? Has it been growing or, in, or decreasing? Because if you have where your people are working, all of them, and their GDP sometimes falls, so, so there is a problem in there because if, if real agriculture was the driver of our economy, it, would, it should be presenting more than maybe 50% of our GDP, but in this case, it's not true. Mm. And yet, about 75% of our people work there. So people are working where there is no money. So you can't talk about so and 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 also I want to tell him that yes you could be having uh, eight hundred million 
Little Romeo Sabras. It's okay, but you have children in our in your midst, you who are malnourished. Mm -hmm. So, so who's so are you producing for that? It's, 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 it's government of Uganda is like that is like a family where the biggest ban banana is given to the, ban the ones on the market, and the children at home eat cassava that is, doesn't even have beans and they end up having kwashako. Because, because, because who's producing, and secondly, who's producing that milk? You see, the problem with Uganda's economy is that it's patronizing, it's, it's, and, and it's not about Museven, by the way. Obote, Obote had his businessmen in town running business. When he went, all of them collapsed. A few survived. And then had his, the Nubians in this Kampara, running some economy. And when he went, they collapsed. Museven has his, who are telling us about the milk they are producing. And our children are malnourished. Because, because never forget that life, human development index, Puts Uganda at 189 out of 189, 189 I think. Meaning, and, and yet, those ones never count money. They count the way of life. Are you heresy? Can you access knowledge, that's education? And do you, do you live a decent life? And, and, and Uganda is doing decimally toward the countries near it are filled states. Even Somalia export, exports some things. So even third countries export and import. Yeah, Somalia exports some charcoal. Yes, yes, yes. But even you're going to export some charcoal. <laughs> In the news on Monday, the headline of, of a government-owned paper was that the government of Uganda, employees and have uh, an government, they are involved in selling charcoal, exporting charcoal. And it's a big cartel. It is illegal, so we don't count it as so, it. So, Yes, but brings in some dollars and then the dollars balance your shilling, which shilling you don't want to accept is falling every day. So 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 all, all of these things must be discussed on these things. But but uh, Uganda has has another big problem. In 1962, uh, the GDP per capita was about $550, dollars $560. As we speak today, it is $817 as per twenty. Because that's what the GDP divided by the population of the people. Mm. In this case, they are dividing me with, with Abigaba and the, my mother in the village. Abigaba is a very humble citizen. Yes, yes, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, I'm not saying Abigaba as a person. I'm, I'm meaning the money of Tessa has. Okay, okay. Uh, when they divide, because, because you could divide at least $800, I have to give you all, all, all the money in the mm. So, But you see, the quality of life of an average citizen of Uganda. Mm -hmm. Is delivered at, at, at an amount below, below 3 million Ugandan shillings. And you want to call me. That's a year. That's a year. Okay. That in the whole year, an average Ugandan lives on 3 million shillings, Ugandan shillings. If you divide it by months, and that money we're discussing is not the money that they have, it is the money of the rich divided among the poor. Because if that's the average, how about the, the poor below average? How are they living? How are they surviving? So I would want eco economics for the people. The economy should be for the people, not for figures. Because GDP can be that I have the whole GDP in my house. Then they get all of you, divide it around. And then when I come here, GDP, GDP. Then we say 80% of our people are involved in 70% of the agriculture, but the GDP, uh, Russia, the, the one they're convenient is, is falling. It means they are working where there is no money. So who, who are the 20% that are working where there is money? Interesting. I'm sure Duncan will yeah. put we'll some where they are, yes, yes, the 20%. In, in perspective. But uh, let me go to Denise. As um, a student of business administration and a player in this economy that <laughs> we are discussing, <laughs> what, what do you think? How, what is your take on Uganda's journey economically? Well, my take in Uganda's economy is, well, I will agree that Uganda is taking steps forward. When you look into the, the history of how Uganda's economy has come from 1962 up to where we are now. Now, we, when you study the politics of Uganda and how it has affected us economically, we see that from 1962 up to the time when Amin was put into power, Uganda's industrialization or manufacturing industry was going higher, but then it's declined, greatly declined by 90% with the coming of Amin from 1970 up to the, 19, up to the early 1980s. Mm. And that's when we had the NRM 
coming into power. Now, the NRM, yes, will agree that the NRM has done something good for our country, economic-wise, because if you look at the manufacturing industry today, we're seeing construction companies, water supply, electricity supply, and all these other things coming into place. But, however, we have a loophole, or there are some things that have put our economy down, and it is an issue for us to um, it's an issue for us to look at to look at now many of um, okay if you know how the gdp works it's not all about the exportation but also what is the national consumption of those goods mm. you know i was so appalled when he told me about lack of market for surplus mm. and and lack of market for surplus yet there are people who are out there that don't have what you are claiming to be surplus. Now, this shows because you that... Because they don't have the purchasing Exactly. Power. Mm. Now, what I feel or what I think could be done or put in place by people who are in power is, one, empower your nationals. Because if your nationals are not able to purchase or do not have the purchasing power, how are we going to cut down the surplus? And how are we going to prove to the other countries that we can do something yeah, about yeah. So, Denise, don't you think that he, he said the president is an activist for markets? Yeah. By looking for markets mm -hmm. where the nationals are going to sell their products mm -hmm. and get money, mm -hmm. are you not empowering them? Which, how do you empower the nationals um, uh, other than that? Well, um, Uganda has so many, or I wouldn't say so many, but we have loopholes, especially when it comes to the education sector. For example, you cannot em empower an ignorant citizen. We need to empower these people with the knowledge, with what they need for a required skill in that particular field, whichever field they are working on. Mm. Now, if you are not knowledgeable, there is no way you're going to be able to, to advance in a certain, uh, like in a sector. So what I think, we are not empowering our citizens. We are empowering a small portion. That is the rich versus the poor, and of which most of the average Ugandans, most of us, or most of the Ugandans, are not empowered enough to export these goods. So instead of us focusing so much on the exportation, let us see how do we improve on the economy that is in, inside, inside Uganda, equipping us with skills, setting up new industries, and perhaps... You want government if, to set up industries? Oh, yes. Now, let me tell you why. Mm -hmm. When you have industries set up, for example, manufacturing industries, you're employing more people into, into these industries. For example, university students. Most of the university students don't know where they're going to go after university. But with, man, with uh, the opening of manufacturing uh, companies, we are going to employ as many university students, or even people who have studied, and they have no jobs. And with this, people are getting income. And also, they should also improve on the industrialization quality of the goods that we, pro that we produce. If the Kenyans are complaining about our maize, what is Uganda doing to improve on the quality of the maize that's being produced and also uh, the other issue is about giving more attention to foreign investors especially we see that local and domestic factories are being suppressed mm. and even these so-called importations or exportations that are being made they are largely from foreign companies so uh, you see there's a lot of there's lack of national building and why are we having a surplus that people are not having anything? That's the question mark that should go behind government. Thank meeting. you. And that question is going to bring me back to you, Duncan. You, you painted a very rosy and flowery <laughs> image for us. I was getting hopeful only to listen to <laughs> Brian um, and Denise here. And then it, it seems like the surpluses you're talking about are not being seen in the pockets mm -mm. of the ordinary citizens. And when we look at other indicators like GDP per capita, flawed as it is, it looks like we have not had so much progress. <laughs> and Denise here is also asking, how can you have surplus when a third of your children below five are stunted? So we, 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 of milk. Yes. I even want to take a whole amount of We want to take the whole of it. <laughs> yes, we shall so, come so, to that. So, yes, so, so, so Brian and, and my sister Denise here, mm want to portray a picture of a welfare state, you know, oh. the Nordic countries, we have Sweden, we have Finland, nobody pays school fees, nobody pays for health care. Everything is catered for by the state, but also that state is taking 
seventy uh, percent of your earnings in mm. form of taxes to give you all that rose fixed and services they give. Mm. But you cannot do that here. Even a few services that government, uh, you know, was giving to the citizenry, most of them seized in 1994, 1995, the uh, structural adjustment program of the World Bank, of the International Monetary Fund. Uh, most of these services now had to be privatized. The Western powers and these are Western, Western, Western Yeah, these are Western powers. Eh? The Western powers now influenced the seven. <laughs> They didn't influence M7. Thank you, but if you can let him learn. They, influence, they didn't influence M7. They influenced everybody. Mm -hmm. Because, Brian, you, you need to agree that you must, for you to develop, mm -hmm. you must work in, in, in an organized world order. You know, there are big boys in Washington and New York who put up this order. Yes, you can say we are excusing ourselves from this order. But you'll get endless problems. You know, like uh, Sudan Khartoum has been having sanctions for decades, maybe three, four decades, and the economy suppressed and suppressed until Bashir was removed because of the, you know, very high cost of bread. That's what happens if you play with the big boys. And, you know, every leader is a lot of Duncan, you're not sounding like your leader. Your leader is usually bashing and, no. and yeah, 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 they can go to hell. No. Yeah, yes, no. uh, but for you... No, talk about World Bank, for example. Yes. Everybody makes a contribution to be there. The money we borrow from there, our, you know, our contributions, we are not, in, you know, we are not going there to beg somebody. No. Countries that have membership make statutory contributions and these statutory contributions that we go and borrow from and make an interest. So they don't do us a favor, but Uganda had to be in an organized world order to be part of those institutions and accept their you know, processes. Uganda was recovering from a very bad shape, by the way, which my two brothers here ignore. They are referring to the GDP per capita that it has not changed from whatever it was in 1962. Mm -hmm. But my friend, like Denizia said, from 19... If you ask me, from 1971 to 1979, the economy collapses completely. I mean, runs it down to negative 8% growth. Negative 8% growth. After that, 79.86, it is at aborted price, but it fails at minus 3. Minus 3%. Three it is still negative. So, the president, you know, NRM comes into power. You don't have even basic services like electricity, Brian. The dam in because you have, you have the, running, you have, you have the running, dam in the ginger running everything, destroying power lines because you are fighting in the, the dam in the ginger, which nobody destroyed by the way. NRA did not fight in ginger, which was uh, installed at capacity one fifty megawatts in nineteen sixty two. By the time NRA reaches Kampala, this dam has collapsed by ninety megawatts. It is at 60. This is the only dam you have in the country. You don't have electricity. Then the second problem is that the industrialists, all of, of them, uh, the you know the Indians of Uganda and different, the the the, the 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 British who had come during you know colonialism and established business here, they have all run away. So all the manufacturing, the industry sector, the service sector, they have all collapsed. So NRM is starting from there. Now, that's not the only problem. You have come, you are stabilizing things, but how do you build uh, investor confidence? How do you build investor confidence? Like now we had these two incidents the other day and last night. Trust me, if you Google Uganda, that's what comes up. Nobody wants to come in such a situation. So you have places like uh, uh, Northern Uganda who stay in those problems, political problems, from 86 to 2006, Joseph Cohen, Today you have a factory of sugar in a truck, which you do not think about 20, 15 years ago. The situation there was so bad. Today you have the roads going to a tarmac roads going to a truck from Guru, going to Kitugum from Guru. You have roads going to Karamoja. You have electricity reaching Karamoja. The country is now beginning to exploit its full potential. So, and this is happening in the last. 15, 10 years, when the country has been, you know, stabilized corner to corner. But before that, we were really since playing the, games. Since the days. 
<laughs> okay, th- thank you very much. Uh, would do you avail that same um, excuse, if I, if I can call it, mm-hmm. to Dr. Polimenton Obote? To say that the negatives and the zeros we are talking about, can't one argue that UPC, for example, when you decided to pick up arms against it, they were also struggling to build a country from a colonial army, from a, a colonial economy. This patience of 36 years later, and we're only talking about 10 or 15, how come you don't extend you, it to the past? You know, that? I come from a very uh, predominantly strong UPC, Background. you know, press, mm. Shane. Mm. Yes, yes. At one Mecca. time, we had six cabinet ministers, six powerful cabinet ministers. Forget what we are getting today. <laughs> so, so, so when you talk about UPC, some of my grandparents still tell us these stories. The, the, UB, UPC, yes, could have had some good, you know, good economic programs, by the way. I have, I have read certain things. I have personally agreed with certain things mm. that UPC did or intended to do because they didn't finish their agenda. But we also must agree that that indiscipline of the government was not going to take Uganda anywhere. Mm. The army was rogue. All security forces were rogue. There was no functional judicial system. There was nothing. There was no institution that was working in Uganda during UPC time. NRI can be an excuse, but, if, but UPC would not have taken us here. Okay, going back to matters of the economy, one of the issues Denise uh, raises is, and you have also mentioned investors, how do you position yourself for investors? And therein is what some commentators have called our problem. That seems the government has a very huge appetite for investors mm-hmm. at the cost of local investors. Mm-hmm. So. Foreign investors can have holidays, they can have access to land, they, they can be helped and facilitated to have their businesses adjusted very fast, which facilities don't seem to be extended to locals. And no wonder, like I mentioned at the beginning, our sectors like telecommunication, even the gold you mentioned to the Middle East, if you find out which companies or which individuals are exporting, you find that they are mostly foreigners. Is this something of concern to, to government? Does it not worry you to have the very critical sectors of your economy, like banking, in the hands of foreign capital. No, you see, what 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 is what is government are really macro macroeconomic issues, issues like stabilizing, you know, inflation, issues like, you know, ec- increased generation of electricity. Our electricity has grown up. We are now going into 2,000 megawatts after commission in Karuma. Government is concerned with making sure that uh, these industrialists get electricity at very cheap Even if rate, the lives of at very an individual rate. citizen is not being transformed. Yeah, so, so I'm coming. Yeah. So those are the issues that worry government. So locally, locally, and Brian here knows where he and I come from in western Uganda. Mm. Let him tell you how many tea factories are in Kanungu. None of them is owned by a foreigner. Uh, Kayonza Tea Factory, ETC, Hey, James Simsings Garuga. These are not foreigners. These are Ugandans. So, government is putting in place uh, different interventions, help local, local you know, investors, local manufacturers. Talk about people like Kazire in Ankore, a very prominent product now called Kazire that has got an opportunity at the recent expo in uh, Dubai to take some products to the Middle East. This is something born and bred in Ankore, locally, with, you know, cheap electricity now, with, you know, basic things. So, government has put in place a Uganda Development Bank, a, you know, agriculturists on large scale, industrialists, manufacturers, it is Uganda get very cheap, around 5%, 7%. So, so, you know, government is thinking about these local actors. Thank you very much. And that brings, you have been smiling. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the whole that is there, owned by Because the Tea Factory was here, as, uh, uh, even the cemeteries had the Tea Factory. But James Musings Garuga is, is Ugandan, but he's like Sudir. It is hard to, to just want, because Sudir and Garuga can do business even outside this country. 
But what he has not answered what I said, that there is patronage in trade and business. That the people he's mentioning, all of them, mm -hmm. ha have a connection to the state, mm -hmm. must, and they support an individual in the state mm -hmm. and a party in the state. And must that change their business and so they will run? The Sudir Empire, that is a big empire in this country, mm -hmm. it's, it's as if it is, uh, it's an empire for this regime. Most of its businesses started and are brought bro in this. People even doubt Hamis Chigund in town who builds houses without plans and they are collapsing on people. And the, ne the next day you see him, he tells you that I have uh, people who can protect me and they are state, they, 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 they gonna state. Does he, has he said that? Yeah, because because, because, because what, what, what's, what, what's the problem with those I think his engineers? Arresting him or questioning him, and why is that police and I'm always inter intervenes whenever he's asked? He's protected by the state. You 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 are going to want to say, um, but that is open. Yeah, I'm, I'm just planning a disclaimer at the end of now, the show. <laughs> now, of course, yes. these are my views, and I can die for yes. them. Uh, what? So we must look at pat patronage and uh, business, mm -hmm. because the more people who are in business are political businessmen. Then it's dangerous. They, they, because, because people that have economies, for example, Denise talks about knowledge. Knowledge is gotten from school. The whole, the whole world has its schools opened, apart from one country, called Uganda. But we also know that children of the connected and the real people in power don't study from here. So have the children gone back to school? The answer is yes, because in their schools they are studying. The ones who are not studying are for the poor who are here. So what's going to happen tomorrow? The richest businessmen are those ones studying, not the ones who are not studying, because they must have knowledge to do business. But, but I also want to tell him that our economy is not investment-led. We are a commodity-led led, 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 uh, country in terms of uh, having our things. And What does that mean? I mean, we are not, there, there is no preoccupation with investment here. We are preoccupied with the commodities we produce, mm -hmm. and then sell them here, do that one here. But 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 the next thing. Yeah, I, I just want you to help my viewers understand the difference between these two. What's investment and what what's commodity you see, being commodity based? You're going to produce some commodities, produce Irish potatoes. Yes. Produce some milk. Talk yes. about it. <laughs> but there is nothing like a milk factory that is adding value. Mm -hmm. To the milk you're exporting. Mm. Why do you ex why do you export liters? Why don't you ex why don't you export kilograms of flour? In terms of I mean, mm -hmm. uh, certified and and proved because because if I carry a hundred tons of coffee and sell it and come here and talk about it, it's a good thing. A, co a kilogram of coffee in my village is three thousand five hundred. Then I go to Cafe Javas and take one two teaspoon and I'm charged fifteen thousand shillings. Why don't we talk about changing our coffee from its, the, the beans it is to, and roast it and being able to, to drink it? Oh, yeah, improve it. But they just, they just sell fresh, like coffee as it is from Buddha to the, to the, to the plains of the ship and talk about it. And, and, and that one has left our people very poor because a person who has a ton of coffee mm -hmm. in Kanung, all he can get is three. It's 350,000 shillings. If you have a ton, you have 3.5 million shillings. Just 3.5 million shillings. Yet with improvement. And, and, and he just created, created our cooperatives. He talks about, about uh, Obote and what and what. But his parents, most likely, started on money from cooperatives. Yeah, I was actually bringing and, and, a and, question and, and, and that's, cooperatives. And, that, and that's mm. it. The money that I gave my father was from cooperatives. But now my, my father has to live alone and struggle as a person. To make me go to school. <clears throat> and, and it also talks about fees and uh, free things from the net. Please, at this one time in this country, when children at the university never paid fees. Boom. <laughs> at, one, at, at, one, at one time in this country, and actually after, after independence, children mm -hmm. would move in UTC buses. Buses owned by government. You, what, all you need is to show us your identity card and where you're going and your, and your school. So we have had, we, we had school. Since they came here, you, you know, people always confuse that point okay. of, of, of school. Of, I, I want to make a comment. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah, please. 
yes, government was paying for everybody going to university. The total of operation of students at Makerere University until liberalization, 1994, I think, it was 5,000 students. They, you know, all courses, all years, 5,000 students. Where were they coming from? They were all coming from government-owned schools. You know? They put, so, the education system then was not giving opportunities to everybody. You know? He knows here. He's from Kanungu. I'm from Ankore there. If you do not get, you know, grades to take you to Ntare School, Barara High School, Makobore High School, Chigezi High School, then you have your education career has stopped. But today, in my own sub-county, there are around five, you know, private secondary schools on, 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 on top of uh, one government secondary school. You know, there are around five private secondary schools in one sub-county, mm. giving an opportunity to everybody. Now, how would the government of Uganda be able to look after all these people if it opens but, uh, free education? But the government of Uganda is telling us that whereas it was collecting 5 billion Uganda shillings in 1986, it's now collecting 20,000 billion. Okay. So okay. it doesn't, doesn't that scale also should then yeah, trickle we, down to other things? It's a bigger problem to take care of. You, you, for example, right now, government of Uganda is concerned, like I've said, with electricity generation. We are building a dam here, Karma Dam, 600 megawatts, among the biggest in East Africa, at $1.7 billion. Some countries in Africa don't have that economy of $1.7 billion. This is a one dam. Whose economy so, is so, so government is saying, let all these young people come up. <laughs> we are going to give electricity to these manufacturers and so forth. So these young people who are coming up are going to find jobs mm. in all these factories, in banks, in what? So, Whereas the government is not taking care of your welfare issues, it is planning for your head. Thank you. And uh, I will now come to you, Denise. Duncan makes the point that what you're asking for, you want government to set up industries and employ people, you, you, you want government, you called it empowering mm -hmm. the citizens through education. It's like you're asking for freebies. And he's saying, look, in this part of the world, you do not have that amount of money to, to give out freebies, like, say, in a welfare state in the Nordic countries. But maybe even if you did, possibly we have elected as a country to have a different nature of the economy, free market uh, economy. And, and therefore, the things you're asking for should come from the private sector. And he has shown some of them coming in education, like the private schools. What, what is your perspective? Are, are you asking us to move from a free market economy to, to something else? First of all, I I don't know what he means by free market economy. What we mean by yes. Um okay, I'm going to go back to what he said mm. about patronage, whereby there is a selected group of people who have held the larger amount or the larger benefit of Uganda's economy. Because if you look at Uganda itself, what don't we have? We have the land, we have the tourism sites, we have the dams. We have everything that we require. But what is the loophole? Well, there are so many loopholes that have led to the economic strain. We're not going to go into the political side of it mm -hmm. and talk about political sectors. Mm -hmm. But we, we public, public um, institutes have their weaknesses that have directly affected us. Now, uh, there, is a, there is an issue when it comes to giving us free, as in we want freebies. Mm. I don't understand what, because if I have, let me say, I have a passion for a certain business. I want to start, uh, let me say, maize milling, and I want to import the, those, those um, I want to import maize now, or I want to increase on my market base in Uganda. How am I going to do that? Yet, we are accepting maize from outside. I'll give you a very clear example, tea. Uganda, when you pass everywhere, Mukono in the West, you will see tea. But why is it that we're having tea from Kenya and it's sold cheaper than the ones in Uganda? Or why is it competing with Ugandan market? Would if, you want us to close off Kenya's product? Don't close it off. Mm -hmm. Don't I'll close the export. It. But make when it... it is here. I would compete it. Exactly. And I read an article whereby it said it was from Oxford scholars. And they said, if you want to... If you want your country, if you, a country is to go into the competitive market, the competitive global market, 
these two countries or the foreign investors and the nationals should be able to work together partner with local companies and see how they can um okay and let these local companies grow and as they partner together how, things how can will... that happen what should government do for mm -hmm. something like that to happen that well I'm doing? um if i'm to give an example if we want our local companies to to compete favorably oh, yes, with to compete favorably yeah. with foreign now he will agree with me that when it comes to foreign companies i'm going to give you a clear example for example when we talk about water now we're seeing that foreign water companies are charged less than the local companies so why is there a difference in the supply because it comes with taxation you want to improve on the foreign investment and suppress your nationals well i want I, I won't agree, or I would say that Ugandans or the, the young people, we have the skills. We go to school, we learn. And if the government claims that we don't have the potential skills to set up these industries that they want us, or they want, or that, that is required, why don't they equip us with the right skills by changing the education curriculum? Now, that, that issue of supporting imported goods, well, I think we need to find a way on how to regulate importation and expand exportation. There are some goods we shouldn't be importing as Ugandans. Like? Like sugar, like tea, toothpicks, serviettes, basic little things. Yeah, but he, he, he mentioned that, you know, we exist in a global village, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. And if you wake up and decide to close the market, for example, on Increase that... Increase the taxes of income. Of income exactly. Product. So maybe you put those yes. tariffs. Yes. That would mean, for example, you exit the East African community. Mm -hmm. That would mean... You know, you, you have sanctions like he, he talked about. And other people also close their markets to your product. Uh, actually, if, most, does most, that most, most, most sanctions are not because are not because people are increasing taxation. Most sanctions are political and, yeah. and, and never economic. Yeah. Most of the times. But only that if you do a political thing that is wrong, the only way they can punish you is put put sanctions on you. But 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 yes, but we can be sure that if you close the market, for example, and say Uganda or, is not going to import or, 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 clothes, or, or, for example, all we are saying, yes. all we are saying, Uganda decided at that time that they didn't want me to come here. Turned mm. in tears. Yes. Did we did we uh, manage? The answer is no. But did any country uh, point a finger at us? The answer is no. We failed by our own because we are saying we want to close something. We do not have an alternative for mm -hmm. that was the problem. Yeah. So never, never, ne ne never forget that. But 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 Duncan Duncan uh, has to know one thing: social services and uh, some other services. But I want to mention them: schools, mm -hmm. the health sector, mm -hmm. security mm -hmm. is a primary role of government. However, we shall not refuse a company that wants to put a social, a social company there. But while that technical company is there, it cannot replace the police or the army. Unfortunately, the our general sector, our, our police and army and military, who should be like the UPDF and what, who should be those professional schools, have been killed. And the technical uh, companies, which in this term is a private, camp, a private school, uh, promoted and mushroomed and owned by the patronage people again. And, and sadly, even you don't know what they are teaching children there, because you no longer have control over them. There are schools in this, in this town that are open and children are going there. They pick, take, pick, take. But the usual schools of the of the Munana Inch, which are government schools, are closed. But lastly, on the children's sector, because for it, for it yeah. is what will make us all break us. Yeah. When 1.8 million pupils start primary one. Only 600 people finish P7. Not pass, finish. Go to P7, do exams. A hemorrhage, a hemorrhage of 1.2 million pupils destroyed forever. Because they can never get any satisfaction. They can't even have skills. So we have a first economy. Like the way it is. Because what we turn out at first anyway. But even if we followed them in the, in the latter years, even in independence, Children who are the brightest were our teachers. Now, if you get a second, a third grade, you go to a UTC, a TTC, become a primary teacher. Now, if you get if you get O, O, E in A level, you go to any TC and become a teacher. 
come teach our children. And we have, you cannot have an economy without an education system that is churning out human resource to support it. And, and I think intentionally, there is, of course, Uganda is into two, people, two groups. They want to be led and the led. And, 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 and clearly, it, it must be through the economy and, uh, and education. That's why the majority of Ugandans work where they contribute less to GDP. Thank you very much. I see that you, you're laughing and possibly itching to make some responses, but we are going to take a break, a short break, and when we come back, we shall dive in uh, with, with, with you, uh, Duncan. As you can tell, the conversation is getting hotter. We are just going to take some water such that we arrest it before it gets very hot. But when we come back, we are going to open up our economy furthermore, look at things like the cooperative societies, tackle unemployment, tackle skilling. We have already been guided towards the education system. Tackle this UDB business, access to credit. So you can expect a very informative and incisive discussion when you come back. See you in a while. Welcome back. Of course, as usual, we never let it get too hot in here. So we take them for a commercial break to take some water, hoping that they can cool down. But before we went for the break, uh, Duncan, it almost had become clear that this is, uh, he, he called it a face economy. <laughs> some people out there have described it as a border border economy, a banana economy, mm. all words to mean it's, it's in shambles. There's nothing to speak about. Mm. And some of the characteristics of, of, of such an economy seem to have come through. One of them is she, she has stated and he has stated that there's no value addition. And I think even in your communication, you're talking about liters of milk, talking about tons of ma liters of milk, not powder, not packet, tons of maize, not flour, not cakes, you know, talking about gold, not jewelry or, you know, something like that. These are characteristics <laughs> of uh, uh, a colonial economy, or what Andrew Mwenda has been defined as a colonial economy. Starting right from there, what's your response to this? <laughs> no, I don't want to agree with that team. statement of uh, first economy. Mm. Border, border economy. Border, border economy and whatever they, you know, characterize, ca characterize mm -hmm. it as. So his reference was, uh, you know, from education. And he's saying that, uh, yes, we are churning out so much people, they don't finish it. Uh, uh, primary education, they do not enter secondary education, and uh, so forth and so forth, which I do not want to agree with, because our education has come a long way. There are so many things that we now do within our, with our own means that we had previously relied on importation, or important expertise. Take an example of uh, look at uh, manufacturing in the pharmaceuticals. You know, pharmaceuticals manufacturing here in Uganda. Uganda is exporting uh, ARVs to the entire region, to East Africa and actually Sadak area, mm. Zambia, Zimbabwe, and so forth. We're exporting ARVs. Mm that are manufactured here and who are the people in these uh, industries in these production lines of LRVs in this in Tinda where we are seated there is the Kampala pharmaceutical industries so you don't have to import Panadol and so forth and these are our pharmacists trained here at Mrago by the way Brian I should tell you that Mrago maintains its position in Africa as the best medical school on the continent there is no debate about hospital. that. <laughs> as the best hospital, as the best training hospital, <laughs> Mrago, Mrago <laughs> Medical <laughs> School is the best medical school. On the I, I hope it's not a competition of height between dwarfs. But no, 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 no doubt. <laughs> so, 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 
I've just given an example. In the pharmaceutical world, we're exporting ARVs and other products that are made here by our pharmacists. I can give you another example. There is a committee right now that is working on uh, a COVID vaccine, a Ugandan COVID vaccine, uh, under the stewardship of His Excellency the President. He has it's, been talking about it since the, April last year. It's called the Presidential Initiative on a Epidemics. They are working on the COVID vaccine. Very soon I was having an, interactive, an interaction with them, actually, last week. They are about to update us. I hope it's us. not the other professor, sir. No, no, it's not the professor. Okay. Yeah, it's not the professor. They are about to update the count on the progress of this. Take an example of, uh, take an example of uh, Chila Motors. Our young people at uh, Makerere University College of uh, Engineering put together this, uh, you know, technology and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, produced an electric car. There is an electric car. There is also a solar-powered car. And now, government is building a, a plant in Jinja, Jinja Industrial Park. So there is going to be mass production of these vehicles that are electric powered and solar powered, not fuel. Also to save the environment and so forth. Yeah, so next year alone, next year alone, they are channeling out 1,000 buses for Kampara. Kampara is going to phase out to uh, taxis. So that we have proper mass trans transport systems that you, are you, going to be manufactured here in Uganda. In Uganda, you have made a good case for value addition, but I noticed that the value addition you're talking about seems to be detached from the majority of the population in Uganda. If you have a population that's exporting liters of milk, exporting tons of maize, mm. and you're manufacturing cars, not even tractors. Don't you think there's a mismatch? Where does an ordinary Ugandan plug into this electric car yeah, economy? So, so this is how an ordinary Ugandan plugs into this electric car economy. There are examples I did not mention. Take an example of uh, cassava. Now, this Panado Yuswaro, or whatever tablet, you see, it's, it's, it's flat. And the, the biggest part of component of it is cassava. But now this cassava has to be refined to some percentage to be used for pharmaceutical purposes. Mm. And one of the things government is trying to do is to set up, you know, a cassava processing plant. Is planning. To, yeah, under UDB, under UDC, Uganda Development Corporation, that can refine cassava. So that these pharmaceuticals of ours that are making Panadol here and the Aravis do not import this refined cassava. Now this is going to help all these cassava growers, northern Uganda is a place for cassava. If you take an, a factory there, you know, farmers are going to directly, you know, get, 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 get market, yeah, get Duncan, an income. Without sounding... You, you come from the east here. Yes. You know you have seen the, the fruit factory in Soroti. Yeah, I was actually it, going to say... It's up and running. Mm -hmm. It's up and running. Now... Farmers in Soroti and Teso region do not have to worry about their mangoes, market, and so forth. The, the, the factory is, is buying from their gardens, you see. So, so now our farmers in the West who are cattle keepers, uh, the milk we sent to Zambia yeah, okay. last week, the, minister that, the, 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 the milk that the minister commissioned to go to Zambia, it is going to the Coca-Cola plant in Zambia. Coca-Cola uses some of uh, this milk. I think it is also refined to some degree of sweetness and, 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 and so forth. So they are going to use it in the you know, soda processing. So even here, there are engagements between government and the Coca-Cola here to make sure that now Coca-Cola here does not import these uh, you know, uh, inputs from anywhere, but our milk in Barara or wherever is refined to be used here. So you can see, this is not rocket science. I'm talking about things that actually touch the common man. Cassava, uh, mangoes, uh, milk, etc. So we are all plugged into this economy. Thank you very much. And Denise, you are going to come in at this point. You have had, it seems like there's a lot happening uh, that you just need to look uh, to see. And there are some things he has not mentioned, but I know if I put it to him, he would mention you. You talked about unemployment earlier on. 
they have so many government programs, youth livelihood program, currently a MIOGA has been rolled out, parish development model is coming, before that you had Intandikwa, NADS, plan for modernization of agriculture. This looks like a government that is really up to the task of ensuring every household has some income and every young person has some work to do. How come, and you start a business, from what you're saying, it looks like Ugandans have not tapped into this goodwill. Well, one thing that greatly confuses me about um, that is, if Uganda has all these resources, why is it that we are seeing uh, different taxes coming in from, you know, okay, for example, taxes that have never existed, even worldwide, why is it that we continue, or do, or why are we continuing to see, um, like the uh, the internet tax? And I heard they now want to start taxing NSSF savings. Why are we seeing very aggressive taxes? And on that point of giving the youth an avenue to gain to gain income or to start up jobs, investment plans, and all those things. Well, one thing I've heard about the Emyoga or the youth fund that they used to give. Well, there were no strict procedures in how that money was being given out. Someone will come to you and say, I went to government, I got money, and I ate it. They will tell you, present where you're going to put up your business, and someone goes and takes a picture of any plot of land, presents it to them that this is where I'm going to put my business, and then you get that money. So how about the ones who are serious about it? So I think the government, in order to help the youth, why don't they put up strict procedures as to how they're giving out this youth? But the youth, youth level program, for example, has guidelines on mm. how many you should be, how you should organize the proposal, the mm. kind of businesses. All these details yes. are there. Now it's coming to that. Yes. Now it goes back to the issue of education. Now there is, in Uganda, you will agree that so many businesses start up, but they can't make it to five or even some one year of their existence. And this is lack of enterprising knowledge because you go into a certain enterprise or an entity and you don't know what to do in that particular entity there are no guidelines and there are so many other restrictions that come with it for example taxation so i cannot go and put in big dreams and yet i know one the taxation system is going to put me down mm. and we have had i won't go into exposing secrets but ugandans have a group of ugandans have put in a huge amount of money to start up a textile no, not a textile, uh, this tile, tile and granite mm -hmm. industry. Yeah. And we have seen it being shut down. And as soon as it shut down, now that's where we see the what? The patronage coming in. Now a bigger force who thinks that they have the money puts up this industry and it's benefiting them. So what happened to the other Ugandans who put in their millions of money to see this industry come up? So for me, I, I really feel if the government really wants to help us, the youth, with, with this issue of unemployment. One, yes, give us the funds, but equip us with, with the knowledge. Mm -hmm. Equip us with a the skill. Then give us the money. And if this is there, let there be procedures. Because I am not going to go into a competition or apply for something, and yet there are no proper procedures. Or I have applied one, two times, I've not gotten it, but a man who got the money is getting it. Why is it that Ugandan youths are being helped by other organizations? For example, the Tommy Elumelu Foundation that gives over 5,000 US dollars to people who what? Who have great ideas. Now that is a foundation that can be held accountable. You know? Because now if, if, if the M Yoga was so effective, the youths wouldn't be complaining. But however, uh, to come on the side, to back him up a little bit, we're not going to keep firing him all the time. <laughs> Well, of course, considering the economy today, we may not be in position to put up all those industries, limited power, limited resources, and all those other things. So I had a conversation with uh, one of UDC members, and it seems like the what government... What is UDC? Uganda Development... Corporation. Co oh, Corporation, okay. yes. They, they said the more they put up industries, the more we shall have the young people being employed. And the, the population of Uganda has increased at a very rapid rate, meaning that the, we cannot hold all the youths at once. Because it was a projection that if Uganda is supposed to meet it, its right GDP, 700,000 jobs have to be created annually 
to fit in for every Ugandan. And today we're only seeing that there's 75,000, only 75,000 being produced annually. So if what you're saying is true, for which we have had it for so many years, that industries are opening, then we are going to see a better reflection for, for Uganda. Yeah, it, it's interesting that UDC exists. I have some information that in the 1950s, Singaporeans came here to benchmark <laughs> on UDC and they created the, the, the semblance of UDC in Singapore, which has done wonders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would read, maybe we should host that, your contact at UDC <laughs> to hear more about UDC and what they're yes. doing. But uh, Brian, I'm going to bring the same question to you. Government has a plethora of government programs. And earlier on, you mentioned uh, cooperatives. Government actually says cooperatives died because of internal corruption and uh, maladministration, not because government killed them. In fact, they now support so many circles. There's even a minister in charge of cooperatives. They are happy to see cooperatives operate. Isn't this a problem of Ugandans? Because into hemorrhagic corruption. Themselves, not, not, not anybody themselves. And they are pointing fingers at corporate cooperatives. Because you can imagine if the corruption in Uganda was that Uganda was, was having goods they were selling and it was a, Uganda was a business. If Uganda was a business itself, it would not be there. Mm. Because, of the, because of, it would not be there as a business. That's why I don't respect that there is a government in this country because all we have is people milked and shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. But 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 I don't want to discuss government programs very much because 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 they, because they take away they take away my time to discuss more important matters in this country many times. I can assure you, I don't know how the statistics. I'm going to say this one: the the, the young people employed in Abu Dhabi, in, mm -hmm. in in foreign countries, as slaves, as modern slaves. Those guys have created more jobs for Uganda than government programs. Mm. The people, you, you can easily go to a village and say, this family, they have a child who went to United Arab Emirates, his house, she's a house guard, and she remits some money to the family. Then find a youth anywhere. Mm. It, it's not easy to go find a person who has used a yoga, <laughs> who has used mm -hmm. uh, nads, nads mm. to benefit the, the, himself or even his family. So modern slavery seems to be gaining tracks attraction more than uh, your government programs think about. So to want to take me to discuss what is not producing things, <laughs> maybe we'll, we'll discuss the rights of these guys who go to United Arab Emirates that they are not killed, raped, and uh, done whatever they do to them. But that's one. So, so I would want to attract you to that fact. Now, cooperatives, we are not killed because of corruption. Cooperatives were power centers. Like they shut political parties when they came to Kampara. They also shut poli uh, cooperatives. But for political parties, there is a notice. We have not seen any notice. Yes, yes, yes. What you do, you put, you, you, you follow them because the government is powerful. You follow them and stifle them. For example, they are stifling NGOs. <laughs> so there is no law on stifling NGOs in Uganda. It's not there. There is no notice. But they, some people are arrested, kidnapped kept for, for however time they want. There is no bail, there is no what. So, 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 so and, 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 and I had a, a government speak about military uh, uh, the, 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 the indiscipline of the 19, of the before 1986 armies, as if he lives in another country. I, I don't know, I don't know if it's Armenian soldiers and opposing soldiers that killed people in November. And that has a negative effect on the economy. You do not go to a country where you are killing people. Broad daylight, where videos are out of people in a military uniform with a Ugandan flag shooting women carrying food. Mm -hmm. And then, and then Abigaba comes to the, to the show and says, that you see, the problem are these two, two, two side bombers who bombed, bombed here. No, the first threats we have are in the Ugandan military, uh, Ugandan, uh, military and uh, police and they have been doing terrorist, ter terrorism acts that have scared away investors. And then others are secondary. Because, because these things must be... We can't remain discuss a very, very small thing. But, uh, but on, on his... Another thing he talks about that I would want to answer is the manufacturing in pharmaceutical industries. You see, when I went to university, I was a scientist. 
and I'm still a scientist. And I've not forgotten some part of my science. There is what they call assembling. You get, you get ingredients of a medicine, of a drug here, and assemble them from here for the next destination. Even beer. We could have beer like Guinness being made in Uganda, but, but, but the powder that makes it comes here, then what we do, we add water, <laughs> put, bottle it, and send it. And we say, this Guinness is made in Uganda. <laughs> There's nothing that's missing. You see, Uganda does not make toothpicks. Does not make panado. <laughs> All they have are ingredients for making panado. They make panado, and then go to the next destination. But we are selling electric cars. Yeah, I'm telling you because it's, because it's, it's, it's pharmacology. Now, now you don't, don't take me scientific because I want to become. I, I don't want to biology here. Now, pharmacology is the process. Pharmacology is the process that starts with identifying a tree or an animal where the drug is. You get the the, the tree or animal, improve it into a form acceptable. Add additions which are called the synergies. Make a drug and make sure that it can cure a person. COVID-19, I think. Has no, 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 no. You see, you see, that, 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 is, that, is the, that, that is the process of being, of, of, pharma, of, of pharmacology, mm. upwards. But you don't just come here, you don't even know the ingredients. So, so which plant in Uganda makes panadol? Where are the raw materials of panadol? <laughs> because you must have raw materials to manufacture. Cassava. <laughs> Cassava, they're, they're going to make, they're, they're, no, they're just going to make a factory. They haven't made one. So if you bring cassava flour from, cassava starts from somewhere, some flour from somewhere, some panel ingredients from somewhere, and assemble them in Uganda and sell them. You're not making panad, no. You're assembling panad. Mm. So these guys want to, want to claim that every assembling they make in Uganda is, is the product of Uganda. To have a product, you must have, you must have a raw material mm. for, on the value chain promoted to a panado tab. But he sits here and then crosses this and says, ah, we're making panado. <laughs> <laughs> Your scientists must be innovative. They are just, they are just depending on... And, and, and lastly, like Mr. Ben said, it's a discussion of, of the two PGMEs. Who is other than the other? That's about Morago Hospital. I mean Morago, Morago Medical School. At one time, Morago Medical School was the best, but also Morago Hospital was the best. Now, I do not know what makes Marago medical school go up and the Marago hospital cannot be talked for. And there's one reason. Because the real social service sector, which is a sore, which, which, whose, whose responsibility is the responsibility of government, was, was do, they are dodging their, their duties. So I go to Marago, you can go to Marago, study, learn using facilities there, which is good which were there before them, which were even there before colonies, even colonists had them. And then after doing all of that, and go and work uh, in another hospital outside the country, as, as, we, try, as, as we take people outside for, 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 for treatment, they are treated by Ghana doctors there. I think I've said many things, but there is this thing about road construction and everything, mm, and the economy, finalizing. You see, I am not. I am. I am not a student of economics or political policy like them. So I am a realist. Mm -hmm. For every infrastructure project built, and even the corruption, whether by the colonialists, whether by Obote, whether by Amin, whether by Museveni, is to go to tap a resource from somewhere and take it away. Oh. Yes, is that and, and, why and, 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 and I'm going to mention it. Is, is that why I don't have any tamaki in Ubudu? Yeah, because you have nothing. To pick. The moment, <laughs> listen, people in Ubunyoro cried for yeah. years There's about, their road, about their, their, road their, their, their road infrastructure. They never gave them roads and what? Now there is oil. They have the best road. In now the they country. have the best roads. They didn't have an airport, international airport, Kabari. That's one. Two, because if I say that example, it's not going to come out clear. There was Koboko had cotton, uh, ginger, cassette, cassette, cassette had Koboko. So the, so the Muzungu had to build a railway, a railway to Kasese, not for the people of Kasese to travel and enjoy the services of the railway. 
they were traveling to go and pick cobalt and copper for their own selfish benefit. At the end, the, the, the template of the economic of the economy of Uganda under colonialism, like power and politics, has shifted from the colonialists to our subsequent governments. And whatever they do isn't for us. It is for their selfish benefit. No change. Talk, talk about the investment at your own peril, you <laughs> die with it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You really had us there. And I'm going to come to you, Duncan, but we are moving towards the end of, of this show. The conversation is sweet, but time is uh, <laughs> finite. So we have to put things in perspective. But I'm very sure that there are some things that have come through that you may want to respond to. And I'm particularly interested in certain things. Number one, the cooperative movement. When one looks at Uganda's economy through the 60s, and I've had even the current mm -hmm. secretary to the treasury saying that Uganda's economy performed the best from 60, uh, 66 to... 64. Yes. Yeah, yes. Before police went wrong. 64 to 69. Yes. And so, but when you look at that time and, and, and the, the immediate time, even in the 80s, you see, actually from the colonial times, you see cooperative movements at the heart of household income, uh, to, to use the language that your president prefers to use. <laughs> These are non-existent, and you have heard uh, what he's saying. Two, to refresh your mind, is the question, are we manufacturing things or are we assembling? <laughs> have we made an electric car? Do we know how to manufacture a tire, for example, a car tire? Yeah, or, <laughs> yeah, before I celebrate, because I was about to celebrate when you were mentioning these things, and then, you know, Brian <laughs> just sends that. And finally, on government programs, you know, a MIOGA, parish development model, all these have been schemes to sort of catapult our economy. And we have been talking about the economies on takeoff, only that is never done. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. You know, let me start with your second question about uh, how, if we can manufacture tire and, and so forth. Brian was joined university. I think he was behind me by a year or so. And that's the time when he uh, said that the Makere University College of Engineering, Professor Kodri, Professor T. Kodri Togboa, who was the, then the, the, principal. the principal of the college, yes, uh, and, and his team put together this technology and came up with, with this electric vehicle. I had left university, Brian was at university, and he was in student, leader, student leadership. So he obviously knows from the bottom of his heart that Makerere spent so much resources in putting together this technology, and we have the technology. Now, my advice for you, I was in Jinja at the industrial park, uh, visiting the plant, Chilamoto's plant, I think last month, and one of the things, one of the raw products that they will need in printing uh, is the bamboo. Now, uh, Mbari people, Great Mbari, where you come from, do that. You're coming for our marijuana food. Uh, very good <laughs> with growing bamboo, which you use for marijuana food, cham cham. Now, you must go in for commercial production of bamboo. Because we actually don't grow it, we pick it from the uh, forest until Ua came in and stopped us. That's what they used to make the that's what they used <laughs> to make the flow. That's what they used to make the flow of the of, of the buses, okay. bamboo. So you can see. And rubber for the for the tires. So yes. we are we are the synthetics. I, I didn't go through <laughs> all the, <laughs> the the parts of the vehicle, but I've just yeah, but, but one not example. to lose your point. Your point is that we may be assembling, but even in assembling the opportunities. No, we are not assembling, we are they manufacturing. Are we are making. We are making cars here. <laughs> and I'm telling you where the opportunities, where you can plug in, where everybody here can plug in. Ah, so that's one. Then two, the cooperatives. The cooperatives we are very uh, divisive and exploitative. You see, cooperatives were like the old political parties. I'm Catholic, I'm DP. I am, I am Anglican, I'm Protestant. I am Amganda, I'm Kabaka Yeka, later Conservative Party. So all these formations were tagged on ethnic or religious groups. It's the very thing with the, the cooperatives. 
go back and look at them today banyankore kwetera na bugisu cooperative they were very divisive in terms of uh, you know tribes ethnicity <laughs> and so forth now uganda was at a point where we needed national cohesion because that's something that had eroded the country duncan so so since independence duncan. since independence duncan bugisu cooperative union established Teso College, Sebei College, constructed roads, contributed to construction of embassies around the world. In every sub-county now, they have been converted into offices for administration. There was an installation. People were educated on this money. If tribalism can deliver that, don't you think? That that's a, so, so, so. <laughs> my second point about cooperatives is <laughs> cooperatives were very exploitative. Okay. Uh, if you go back and see my grandfather who was a farmer who entirely you know his life depended on coffee that's the only thing he did his entire life he takes this coffee to the uh, to the Chitehurzi Chitehurzi was the first point where mm. the cooperative had a contact it had an office it mm. was the at parish level if you go to, to most of these places those par or or the parishes there is another building, the parish yes. office, mm -hmm. and then the, the you know, mm -hmm. the, which is the, the big production unit. Unit. <laughs> Yeah, the cooperative which office. Is and even mm -hmm. Now, my grandfather would carry this coffee, take it to the cooperative. Yes. And, and first of all, they told me this. Even in measuring, our grandparents were being cheated. In measuring, these elites managing the cooperatives at the parish level, we are using wrong scales. So, if, if this is bag is 100 kilograms of coffee the man was you know it would come out 90 the weighing scales are on even on the cheating in prices and and so forth but even if the basic cast coffee and government even the best cheating you'd hide. so there was cheating <laughs> in terms of waiting of, of, of weighing in terms of prices because the managers of the of these you know cooperatives would sit and determine prices we are going to pay you 50 shillings for a kilogram of coffee which they are selling to an exporter this coffee they are selling to an exporter 10 times at 500 shillings per kilo they were very exploitative they are very exploitative so for national cohesion to for, for a farmer to benefit from his sweat coffee miracle whatever it was very good to do away with these middlemen these were very these were middlemen they were doing nothing they were not adding any value to the coffee they were just middlemen ripping middlemen? off ripping off so, the, so, so who was complaining ripping off the the farmer government. So, so government has come in now yes organized farmers organized different through groups what? through corporate now savings and cooperative groups circles now savings and cooperative groups these are not you see cooperatives were marketing groups you know we come we, we pull together our coffee, then we go and take and it to the best buyer. Again, higher. Uh -huh, by steering, steering sure. from the, the poorers of the coffee. Now, the savings and cooperatives are saying, you, we are a farmer, we are here to empower you. Empower you. Come and borrow some money from us. Let's, let's pull together resources. Government will put something in the circle. Come and borrow cheaper, you know. Go, go, so, go so, produce so, so, and sell directly. So, so, so Duncan, you, the farmer, sell directly. Duncan, not to a middleman. Duncan, to who? Duncan. Sell directly, not to a middleman. Duncan, I'm wondering. To a factory now. Because we have Which, factories. Like what? milk, if you go to Ankore, milk is going direct to Faro, diaries is going direct to who, who is the owner of these places. I don't know the owners of these factories, but so, there are factories that milk is yes, going Duncan, to the factory so, so, so just a quick one to, to interrogate that idea. <laughs> a cooperative is a membership based organizational entity you go there if like bugisu cooperative union its leadership is elected by the members if they are being cheated wouldn't they throw out the the the, the leaders who are cheating them I'm, I'm still interrogating who has complained so i i think we need a day to talk about cooperatives mm. you see cooperatives were run by upc elite upc elite mark that Good. So, Good. So, Finally. so 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 Finally. no 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 the point <laughs> i'm making is <laughs> My grandfather that was its own that was its own and his grandfather his grandfather and his grandfather farmer where does he take his appeal whom will he you know mob mobilize and, and say let's, call, let's take on this giant of UPC nobody so they were exploited for centuries and decades it was part of the UPC in Uganda thank you thank you thank you very much <laughs> our, our time is up but maybe i'm just going to get one comment from you 
and then uh, we, we, we shall have a couple of minutes to say our parting shots. Recently, I, I was uh, traveling, and I've, I've, I found so many young girls dressed in uniform. Uh, I was wondering, are these students? Then I quickly realized these are going to the Middle East. Later, I saw a video of them singing that Katonda Yavademo Enen song. It is good. It's like they're escaping, <laughs> you know, <laughs> running away from, 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 from hell. An economy that's working for the people. Why are we seeing young people going into slavery? We all know the stories that come from the Middle East. Why are young people just thumping and very happy that finally they're out of this working economy? <laughs> yeah, there, there is a lot of misinformation about external labor export. Mm. The first is, you know, bit of misinformation is about this slave trade, the, the, the slang that the Bryans have given this, you know, this process. It's called modern slavery. Modern slavery, whatever you want to call it, which mm. is very vulgar, demeaning, and wrong. Yes. Because the, the Middle East is asking Africa, not only Uganda, mm -hmm. they have uh, engagements with different countries. Actually, before these engagements came to East Africa, they had been dealing with most of the countries in Western Africa. So, so they, are can, they are coming here and saying, we have a skills gap for plumbers, for technicians, eh? for security, for security, for accountants, for ETC. But they come here and they find even Uganda is, you know, short of plumbers, short of, of, of technicians and so forth. So what happened? Now, the skills that Uganda has are domestic workers. But I can tell you that labor export companies have positions for these different, you know, categories of workers. Skilled workers, skilled workers, technicians, you know. But we don't have those skills here. So we end up taking domestic workers. Isn't that an indictment? But also... All the domestic workers who have gone through the proper and legally approved channels of labor export, a registered company that has a license, that has a partnership, has signed an MOU with the, with the Minister of Gender, and the Minister of Gender has signed an MOU with the, with the, the, labor, with the, with the, with the country of, of this labor importing company, say Saudi Arabia or Qatar, Minister of Gender here, has arised with, with the respective but, ministry on the other side, and there is a proper agreement. Those, you know, people have not had problems. So the how, is a, girl, had how problems. is a girl in the end supposed the to have, access those MOUs? The people who have had problems are people who are going through Panyas, through your village in Ududa, end up in Kenya, they are trafficked, they are in Oman, and they are being, you know, sold off. So how is a girl in the end who wants to go for this opportunity? How will they know about these MOUs and... Yeah, you see, that's the company that's legit or not. You know, you know, services are centralized in this country. Every district, for example, has a community development officer. If you want to travel abroad, please go to your district, speak to the community development officer, who is, by the way, an officer of Ministry of Gender, so that they guide you through these processes. They, 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 they give you a list, because there is an approved list by government of Uganda of the licensed companies that are supposed to take... There are even CDOs at the sub -counties. That are supposed to take people out of this country. So don't jump on a ship that is sailing through your village. Thank you. And our, time, our time is fast spent. Fair enough. Uh, within about a minute for each one of us, just give you a parting shot on the economy of this country. We, we end at a point where... I'll go accept that the skills okay. we have in this country to export mm. are not high skills, mm -hmm. but skills of uh, house girls. That's what they call them here. You can call them what you Domestic want to call work. them. Domestic <laughs> workers. And they are skills that are, are on the all and from homes, not from schools. Mm -hmm. Again, to my point of education, education, and dropout, dropout. I don't want to say many other things. I have told you that the economy of Uganda isn't for the people of Uganda. The struggle I've been involved in change Uganda is not that they, this economy leaves the sharks who were colonialists and then gave it to gave it to the black Africans who also represent colonialists. So that all of us can have 
some things to call home and some things to take home as a people and have freedom. Because without freedom, you cannot have an economy. Without There's no economy to talk about that is ours. We're talking about the poor economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Denise, your parting shot. Yes. Uh, me, I will talk about the allocation of resources. If our resources are allocated in the right way, well, today we're talking about economy. I don't want to touch more on the political side, but those taxes that we use, the revenue that we get, if we put it into the right places for the right reasons, I believe we shall improve on our domestic industries and also on our national income in general. So my or the take from today's discussion is the education sector. How do we have the youth or every other person equipped with skills that will help them reach the quality of the global market? Yes. Thank you very much, Denise, and you have the final say, sir. Yeah, so mine is really to tell Ugandans that we are a level where the economies, rather the drivers of the economy, have been put in place. The electricity, the roads, we are building a second airport. Uh, last week, a uh, civil aviation authority <laughs> announced that uh, you can fly from so many parts of Africa direct to your tourism destination, for example, in Arua, in Kasese, and I see my neighbor here is laughing because now she thinks this does not help a uh, local person. But this tourist who lands in Alua is going to spend. You know, they will buy aircraft, mm -hmm. they will eat food, they will tourism. sleep. All these things are not owned by government. You, you know, they will mm -hmm. sleep in a road constructed by local person. The food they will eat is grown by local person. So we all benefit through this. Mm -hmm. They are building a road from um, Bushengi, my, my home, uh, to, 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 to Kisoro, but through Kanungu. Kanungu has never had a summer I road. hope it's not on borrowed money. <laughs> so they are building a road to cover that. It's called a, it's a tourism corridor to Mugahinga National Park. So Brian here and his people are going to be able to step into that now, that road, by building lodges around it for tourists. Because all that place is a tourist place. There's, there's a rift valley, there are forests, there are national parks. As we conclude, sir. So you can see, the drivers are there. Mm. If you go to Karma today, a, a, a big <coughs> dam that has been built here that will give electricity, it's going to employ 1,000 people, resident staff, you know. They will need food, they will need ETC. So the, 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 the farmer in Chiriandonga and Oyam are going to benefit from the workers at Karma. So the drivers of the economy are here. Let's tap into them. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian, for taking our time to be with us. Thank you, Denise, for sharing your mind. And thank you, Duncan, for giving us more than two hours uh, to have this conversation. The verdict is always yours. As the Youth Roundtable, we bring the views. And as you can see, the people we bring call it a spade if it is so, not a, a, a big spoon. What we want is for you to listen to these views and find where you can plug in to build a better country. Till next week, keep it at Civic Space TV.